Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History, as we look today at how the United States was finally pulled into the First World War. Now, the empire of Japan's ruthless invasion of China had demanded some American response, but Americans wanted a response short of war. And so, in 1940, in July, the United States placed an embargo on Japan. Japan, having very few uh, raw materials or natural resources of their own, they depended on imports uh, of many things. And so at first, the United States um, banned the export to Japan of aviation fuel and most types of machine tools, tools used in factories to make other machines. Um, two things that Japan needed. In September, the U.S. went further. Um, embargoing the sale of scrap metal to Japan, Japan depending on recycled metal for much of their metal usage. Um, shortly after these two embargoes, um, Japan signed the Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy and moved into French Indochina. In 1941, the U.S. went further, cutting off all sales of oil to Japan who up to that point bought 80% of their oil from the United States. The United States actually being a major oil exporter um, well into the mid-20th century. The British and the Dutch also put embargoes on trade with Japan, and the Japanese were growing desperate by the summer of 1941. And encircled by potential enemies, deprived of natural resources, Japan began developing an Eastern strategy. Um, in September of 1941, although both the U.S. and Japan and other countries had developed war plans for conflict in the Pacific just in case, but now they started getting specific. Fortunately, the United States sort of knew about this, as we had cracked Japan's secret code and knew an attack was coming somewhere in the Pacific, although we didn't know exactly where. We assumed it would be in the Philippines, those being very close to Japan. And the Japanese did attack the Philippines, but that would not be the first place they hit. Because, of course, on December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor, a major naval base in Hawaii, uh, in a surprise attack one Sunday morning hoping to catch the Navy off guard, as the Japanese had done to the Russians back in 1904, hoping to do so much damage to America's Pacific fleet that we would not be able to fight them, or at least um, not for a long time. And the attack was um, quite successful. Um, many American ships were sunk. Um, one of the most famous was USS Arizona, um, a battleship that went down um, to the bottom of Pearl Harbor and remains there to this day, where it is classified as a military cemetery because so many of the sailors who went down with the ship could never be rescued and their bodies were never removed. Another battleship, Oklahoma, capsized and sank, uh, but was later raised and sold for scrap. The other six battleships there were also all damaged, but eventually repaired and returned to active service. Many other ships were damaged or destroyed too as were many airplanes on the ground. In total, um, 2,400 Americans were killed, 1,200 more wounded. But things could have been even worse, because while all our battleships were damaged or destroyed, and many other ships and aircraft were, our aircraft carriers and some ships were out on a training exercise that day. And aircraft carriers, which would turn out to be one of the most important ships in the war, um, avoided destruction at Pearl Harbor. Indeed, some people have proposed that the U.S. knew the attack was coming and allowed it to happen unopposed because some leaders wanted to pull America into the war and thus made sure the aircraft carriers were out to sea. Personally, I consider that very unlikely, but as a conspiracy theory, you'll hear from time to time. Um, the Japanese were concerned about the aircraft carrier's survival as well. Um, indeed, the admiral um, who had planned the attack, Yamamoto Isoruku, um, had already predicted that the, he could run wild considerably for six months or a year, but had no confidence for a second or third year. 
and now he was sure that would come true. He had felt attacking the U.S. would be a mistake in the long run, so in order to make a plan, he had done his best. So in response to this attack, President Roosevelt asked Congress for a declaration of war in response to this surprise attack. The Japanese had not meant it to be a complete surprise. They had prepared a message intended to be delivered to the United States with a list of demands the U.S. would have to refuse, but a list of demands they would have delivered once the planes were already underway. As soon um, as, soon as we refused, the planes would come out of the sky and attack the naval base at Pearl Harbor. But that list of demands was delayed, so it was a total surprise, which seemed like fighting dirty. Congress passed the declaration of war overwhelmingly. In the House of Representatives, there was only one vote against the war. Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin, who after many years out of Congress, returned for a second term to vote against World War II, as she had voted against the First World War. And three days later, December 11, 1941, Germany and Italy, to help their ally Japan, declared war on the United States. So now, over two years after the invasion of Poland, a decade after Japan's invasion of China, the United States was now involved in World War II, a war that President Roosevelt said was to make the world safe for democracy. But the bombing of Pearl Harbor was only the first of many attacks the Japanese would make on the U.S. and our new allies. Um, they attacked American air bases on Guam and Wake Island and launched a major invasion of the Philippines. Now, the commander of American and Filipino forces, which by this point were partially separate in preparation for the Philippines' upcoming independence, was Douglas MacArthur, um, a veteran of World War I and at one point overall commander of the U.S. Army. But while he knew an attack was likely and had made some preparations, um, he wasn't completely prepared. He himself had to withdraw to, uh, um, to a fortified island in Manila Bay and eventually fled to Australia at the president's orders. But before leaving, made a promise, people of the Philippines, I shall return. Most Americans, though, and much of the Filipino army pulled back as they had planned into the Bataan Peninsula, surrounded by water on three sides, only having to defend a narrow strip of land. The plan, and this plan had existed for some time, was to hold out there until the United States could reinforce or rescue the soldiers on Bataan. But that plan had not taken into account the possibility that much of the U.S. Navy would be sunk at Pearl Harbor on the date a couple days before. And so the soldiers in the Bataan Peninsula began to starve, began to run out of water and other supplies. And eventually, um, after several months, were forced to surrender. Except the Japanese tradition of Bushido, the way of the warrior, had said it was better to fight to the death or commit seppuku, also known as harakiri, ritual suicide, rather than be captured. And so they had no respect for anyone they captured um, in warfare. Uh, and they just captured 76,000 American and Filipino soldiers who were forced to march 60 miles to the nearest railroad junction. From there, they were shipped off to various prisoner of war camps. This 60-mile march is known as the Bataan Death March. Many of these men, already starving and dehydrated, simply died um, of starvation or dehydration. Um, but if, if you stepped out of line because uh, you were tired or maybe saw a stream or puddle and wanted to get some water, you might be shot dead on the spot. If you looked at a Japanese soldier disrespectfully, you might be shot or the swords that they often carried could be pulled out and you might be beheaded on the spot. Um, over the course of the 60-mile march, 10,000 of those 76,000 prisoners um, were killed um, or died of their poor conditions. And then those who ended up in prisoner of war camps um, often died of starvation um, or mistreatment of various types. Just for example, when uh, American forces were finally pushed into surrender in the Philippines, 
The highest ranking American officer left was General Wayne Wright. Um, he survived um, several years as a Japanese prisoner, but as you can see, um, lost quite a bit of weight in the process. Does not look quite as good after as before. And so between um, the invasion of the Philippines and attacks on Pearl Harbor and other American territories, Americans were terrified the Japanese might attack the United States directly, which we now know simply wasn't possible based on the range of their ships and aircraft. But Americans were terrified. Um, all lights were turned off or blankets nailed over windows at night so Japanese pilots wouldn't be able to launch a night attack. And furthermore, Americans worried about the many Japanese Americans living in the U.S., either older people who had been born in Japan and immigrated back when they could in the late 1800s, or their children or grandchildren born in the United States, many people fearing they would serve as spies or saboteurs for the Japanese Empire. And so, in response, about 11, sorry, 110,000 Japanese Americans, many of them citizens, um, were forced to sell at short notice most of their property, pack up what little was left, and move to internment camps, big prison camps scattered throughout the western United States. Um, and while conditions weren't terrible, having to sell most of your property on short notice um, itself is, uh, is pretty humiliating and means you'll probably get pretty low prices for what you have to sell. Um, and they would stay in these camps until 1945, with um, one major exception to get out. Because many of them were citizens. Um, what was one way that many, um, that many um, young men got out of the camps? They went into the army. Some were even drafted, as U.S. citizens can be. And um, they served in all Japanese units, the most famous of them, the 442nd Infantry Regiment, which fought in Italy and France. They didn't send them into the Pacific. And in their fighting in Europe, they became the most decorated regiment of the war, fighting bravely while their families were in prison camps back home. And of course, these were, for the most part, American citizens. And some responded as Americans respond to mistreatment. They sued. The two most famous cases um, which reached the Supreme Court were Hirabayashi versus United States, which reached the Supreme Court in 1943, and Korematsu versus United States, which reached the Supreme Court in 1944. Um, and in these cases, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the internment of the Japanese, saying, saying that it was not a violation of their civil rights um, on racial grounds as they proposed. The Supreme Court said they were not being imprisoned because they were Japanese, but rather because they were Japanese, a distinction you can make when you're a lawyer. They said it was not because they were racially Japanese that they could be interned, but rather because their ancestors had come from Japan, they were potentially a threat in a national emergency. The fact that most people from Japan are racially Japanese was purely a coincidence, said the Supreme Court. In addition to basing this on a national military emergency, they partly based the internment, too, on the Alien Enemies Act, one of the Alien Acts of 1798. So in part, it was John Adams who helped to imprison the Japanese. Eventually, the U.S. government did apologize and in 1988 pay every survivor $20,000, but a pretty small and late apology. The U.S. Supreme Court, too, has partially, but not fully, overturned this ruling. In theory, in a national emergency, we might be able to imprison people again based on their nation of origin. Now, as I mentioned, the United States was not the only victim of Japanese aggression. Um, you know, in, uh, in December of um, 1941, the Japanese controlled what is shown on the map as red, pink, and yellow. Um, but nearby, besides American territory, um, were territories controlled by our allies, which the Japanese invaded too, um, attacking British and Dutch colonies throughout Asia. On Christmas Day, 1941, the Japanese captured Hong Kong, then a British colony on the coast of China. 
and controlled it for the rest of the war. December 8th, the Japanese invaded British Malaya, today part of the country of Malaysia, and by January 31st had captured the entire Malay Peninsula and were pre prepared to invade the um, city of Singapore um, on island off its southern tip. And February of 1942, the Japanese captured Singapore in the largest surrender of British forces in their history. 80,000 British troops and colonial troops taken prisoner, many of whom died, as of course many prisoners of the Japanese did. This is comparable for the British um, to what Bataan was for the U.S., America's surrender in the Bataan Peninsula being by far the biggest surrender of American troops in our history. Now, among the British troops who surrendered at Singapore were many soldiers from India, then part of the British Empire. The Japanese encouraged Indian soldiers to join the Japanese army and fight alongside them to win India's independence from Britain. And some, like those guys in the upper corner, did decide to fight for the Japanese. Most, however, stayed loyal to Britain, and the Japanese treated them, if anything, worse than other soldiers, viewing them as traitors to their Asian identity. Um, February 19th, the Japanese bombed the city of Darwin in the Northern Territory of Australia. Although it didn't do much physical damage, it had a powerful psychological effect. Australia devised a plan of sorts to evacuate all their people to southeastern Australia and just defend Sydney and Melbourne and the capital of Canberra should they be attacked, abandoning 90% of their territory. In January of 1942, uh, Japan invaded Burma, then a British colony, now the country of Myanmar, with a little help from the Siamese army too. By May, the British had retreated all the way to the border of, with India. In February, the Japanese invaded the Dutch East Indies, what is now the country of Indonesia, um, where in fact some Indonesians welcomed them as liberators from the Dutch. Um, although um, pretty soon those who had welcomed the Japanese turned against them, seeing them as even worse than the Dutch. Um, after the war, the Dutch would never really regain control of Indonesia, and this would lead to Indonesian independence officially. Um, in 1949. The uh, Japanese uh, moved into New Guinea, part of that being Dutch territory, part of it being a colony of Australia, um, conquering up close to three quarters of the island. Um, in February of 1942, the Japanese Imperial Navy um, battled the Dutch and French navies um, in the Java Sea, in the midst of the East Indies destroying most of the Allied fleet um, in the Pacific. So, to put it differently, between December of 1941 and uh, late February of 1942, the Japanese had taken over almost everything shown in the map in dark purple. Not bad for about three months. Um, but things would change in April. In April of 1942, the Allies began to regroup and better coordinate their commands. General Douglas MacArthur, um, who had escaped to Australia, was put in command of all Allied ground forces, so Army and Marines, in the Pacific. Admiral Chester Nimitz of the U.S. Navy was put in command of most Allied naval forces in the Pacific and one overall commander for American, British, Dutch, Australian, and other forces um, fighting in the Pacific. And on April 18th, um, Americans would finally strike back. April 18th, 1942, 16 American bombers, uh, under the command of Colonel Jimmy Doolittle, were stripped down as much as they could. They took everything they could out of the planes to save on weight, um, except for a few bombs. They put them on aircraft carriers at the extreme end of their range, and they flew one way over Tokyo, bombing the capital of Japan, before, for the most part, landing in China, where the Chinese, being our allies, helped most of them escape. A few, though, landed in the Soviet Union and were imprisoned for the entire war on the grounds that the Soviet Union and Japan were neutral toward each other. 
In the damage to Tokyo was pretty minimal, but the psychological effect was huge. For Americans, we had finally struck back after the attack on Pearl Harbor. For the Japanese, their home islands had been attacked for the first time since the 1200s AD. And in May, um, American code breakers learned the Japanese were planning a major attack on Port Moresby, um, a town on the southeastern corner of New Guinea, one of the few parts of the island they didn't control. That too would be um, one step in invasion of Australia itself. Um, and so Allied forces moved to stop them in the Coral Sea, which lies between New Guinea and Australia. And the Battle of the Coral Sea would be important for a couple of reasons. In the short term, it's important because in May of 1942 in the Coral Sea, the Japanese were stopped for the first time in a major battle. Port Moresby was never captured. Australia was never invaded. Um, but it's also significant in a longer term sense, too. This would be the first naval battle in the history of the world where the opposing ships never saw one another. The fighting was conducted completely by aircraft launched from aircraft carriers. Their planes flew to our fleet and bombed them. Our planes flew to theirs and bombed them. Um, in the end, the battle was more or less a draw um, in terms of men and ships lost. Again, a defensive battle, a draw is good enough. And again, the invasion of Australia was blocked. But while this was the first major battle in which the Japanese were stopped, um, the Japanese weren't done yet. And they planned another major attack hoping to slow down the United States or possibly discourage America enough to get America to quit the war after all. Planning an attack on the American military base at Midway. Midway is a little coral atoll, a low-lying island basically made of dirt and other debris that have piled up on a coral reef where the U.S. had a naval and air base um, about Midway across the Pacific Ocean between the U.S. and Japan. Um, the Japanese hoped this would be another surprise attack. If they could destroy or capture this base, they would then have moved on to Guam, to American Samoa, to Hawaii, and to get America out of the war. But, um, once again, American code breakers warned us of the Japanese attack. And so, what was supposed to be a surprise attack on American forces ended up as a surprise on the Japanese as American planes flew to attack the Pacific Fleet um, before they expected us, before they could launch their attack. And in some cases, even catching the Japanese warplanes on the decks of their aircraft carriers fueling up. So they were strapped down and connected to their fuel hoses um, and un unable to fight back. In the Battle of Midway, the Japanese lost four heavy aircraft carriers, the U.S. losing one. The Japanese lost over 300 planes, um, and many of their best pilots, whom they were not ever really able to replace. America lost about 100 planes. Obviously, other ships were lost too, but uh, in comparable levels. A huge defeat for the Japanese, and um, a defeat that would end their last major attack of the war. The Battle of Midway ended um, on June 7th. 1942, having lasted three days. June 7th, 1942 would be exactly six months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Yamamoto's prediction he could run wild for six months had proven precisely correct. After this, Japan would launch a couple small attacks elsewhere, but they were, for the most part, on the defensive. The Battle of Midway could easily be considered the turning point of the war in the Pacific. From here, we'll push them back, although admittedly, very slowly and at great cost. But we will do it, because after the attack on Pearl Harbor, American spirit of isolationism vanished. Americans pulled together to defeat the Axis, preparing for the battlefront, but also, just like in World War I, on the home front as well. Um, but on an even larger scale. 
And just as the government had regulated much of America's economy during the First World War, it would do so to an even greater degree in the Second World War. January 16, 1942, the War Production Board was created to manage the nation's manufacturing output, um, which was turned entirely toward the war effort. Unemployment vanished almost overnight. And while conservatives newly elected to Congress began shutting down many of the New Deal's make-work programs, that was okay because they were no longer needed. All Americans had a job to do. As all industries turned towards war production, um, automobile and aircraft factories began turning out warplanes and tanks and ships. Um, Henry J. Kaiser, who had worked to this point in construction in California, began producing Liberty ships, which were mass-produced vessels made of prefabricated parts um, that could be built at factories anywhere and shipped to the coast and assembled. Um, a ship of a type that had once taken 200 days to build could now be assembled in 40 days. Um, once, as a publicity stunt, he assembled one in just 14 days from start to finish. In another case, um, again as a stunt, one was constructed um, from the point the kit reached the port until it went out to sea in just four days, 15 hours, and 29 minutes. Um, again, applying the concepts of mass production to shipbuilding. Now these were not warships, these were cargo ships, these were troop transports, but those were very important to the war effort as well. After the war, the government sold many of these off cheap, which helped to create many new shipping companies after the war. Now, to keep these factories running and the vehicles they built running, um, is the uh, United States instituted gasoline rationing. Um, to save fuel for the war effort, um, Although that was not the only concern, maybe not even the main concern, the United States produced a lot of oil, a lot of gasoline. What we didn't produce much of was rubber. Rubber, of course, comes from trees, um, and trees that don't grow in the United States. When the Japanese took over Malaya and the East Indies, that gave them control of major supplies of natural rubber. German U-boats made it hard to get rubber from West Africa or its original homeland, Brazil. Um, and so gasoline rationing also cut down wear and tear on tires, which could not be easily replaced. Also, during the war, the United States developed synthetic rubber. People had experimented with this before, but not very successfully. Now, though, when there was a wartime pressure to do so, um, man-made rubber was developed successfully. By the end of the war, the U.S. had 51 synthetic rubber plants, reducing our dependence on foreign rubber. Farmers prospered once again as the United States was feeding our armies and the armies of our allies. Once again, new machines, better types of seed, improved fertilizers made them even more productive than ever. And yet, to make sure there was plenty of food for our soldiers and our allies, food was rationed throughout the United States. During World War I, uh, Herbert Hoover in the Food Administration had asked people to voluntarily limit their food intake. Now, though, it was rationed by the government. Everyone was issued on a regular basis a ration book with little coupons about half the size of a postage stamp with different categories and point values on them. And so, if you bought food in the store or some other things like gasoline, not only did you have to pay money, but there was also a point value for that food, and you had to turn in ration points um, of equal value from your book, and you used up all your ration points. In principle, you couldn't buy any more of whatever that was until next month, although some shopkeepers sold extra stuff on the black market at a higher price, which was illegal and unpatriotic, but it did happen now and then. Um, some of the rarest foods were those hard to produce in the U.S., like sugar or fruit or coffee. Things made of metal were almost impossible to buy, as it all went into war production. The same for rubber. They held scrap metal drives, nationwide recycling campaigns. 
Um, nylon stockings had been invented for ladies in 1939. They vanished because all the nylon, also all the silk, was used to make parachutes. And one reason we needed rationing was because people finally had money to spend. Um, full employment led um, to, to inflation um, very early in 1942 um, until the Office of Price Administration uh, was created and froze prices on 90% of goods sold in the United States. Businesses could not raise the price on most things. Um, they also put controls on rent. Um, as people moved to cities looking for work or to be near military bases, rents began to shoot up until the OPA put a stop to that. Of course, as uh, workers were in great demand, wages soared. Companies tried to attract workers from a limited labor pool. Many adult men, either volunteering or being drafted for the war, although if you worked in a vital war industry, you were often exempt from the draft. My grandfather on my mother's side worked for U.S. Steel. Um, he and most of the men at U.S. Steel did not have to be drafted unless they had done ROTC in college, in which case they were called up right away as part of the reserve officers training board. Um, but um, pretty soon the wages were also limited by the War Labor Board. Um, again, to try to reduce inflation, the War Labor Board also tried to regulate labor disputes between employees and employers. Most unions promised early in the war not to go on strike in any way that would hurt the war effort as a matter of patriotism. Although when wage limits were imposed, some unions went on strike anyway, until the government passed the smith Connolly Act in June of 1943 which allowed the U.S. government to seize and run any factory shut down by a labor dispute and made strikes against one of those newly government-run industries a criminal offense, so essentially outlawing strikes in vital war industries. And um, United Mine Workers went on strike anyway, shutting down coal mines repeatedly until the U.S. government stepped in, took over the coal mines, and imprisoned some of the United Mine Workers. The government also briefly took over the railroads, although for the most part railroad executives tried to be very cooperative with the government, as they didn't want the government completely taking over, as they had done during the First World War. But if employers cannot offer better pay, what else might they offer to encourage people to work there? Why else do you work besides your pay directly? The benefits. And many companies began offering health insurance plans for the first time. Many began offering pension plans for the first time. These not being covered um, by the wage caps that otherwise affected uh, most industries. And so in having access to health insurance um, and having pensions to look forward to, brought many of the working class into the middle class, um, which would contribute to great prosperity in the country after the war. Another way that employers dealt with a shortage of working men was by hiring working women. More than six million women, at least half of whom had never worked outside the war before, entered the labor force. This was seen as both practical and patriotic. And while many women had gone to work during World War I and then gone home when the war ended, quite a few of those who worked during World War II chose to stay in the workforce. And during the war, although not once it ended, the U.S. government tried to help out with this, setting up over 3,000 government-run daycares to take care of working women's children during the war. And other women joined the military directly although not, at least officially, in combat duty. And each branch of the military had their own women's branch. Women in the Army were known as WACs, serving in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. The Navy was pretty cute. They called theirs the WAVES, Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service. There were WASPs, uh, Women Air Force Service Pilots, who, all they couldn't see combat, would often fly planes from factories to the air bases 
uh, many trained pilots, um, and quite a few died in training accidents, even if they never saw combat. It could still be pretty dangerous to be a wasp. Um, many women, too, served as nurses in various branches of the military um, or as civilians. Um, and in many ways, the wartime economy was kind of a cruel twist of fate. During the Depression, there had been plenty to buy, but no money to buy it with. During World War II, there was lots of money, but nothing to spend it on. Um, but people had something to do with their money nonetheless. To fund the war, the U.S. government again began selling war bonds. Um, indeed, World War II would cost more than twice as much as all previous American wars combined. But war bonds, a loan to the government to be paid back with interest later, was both an expression of patriotism but also a sound investment. And as uh, they were paid off with interest after the war, creating a long period of prosperity, even better than that of the 1920s. And there was a whole series of war bonds issued repeatedly throughout the war um, and heavily advertised. The fifth war bond, um, we can see something interesting in. Um, we see a V there. The V stands in part for the Roman numeral five for the fifth war loan, but also V was used throughout the war as a symbol for victory. You can see there are two, three dots, and a dash, the Morse code for V. And it works out that the first four notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony are essentially the same sound, three short notes and a longer one. And that was often used as a symbol for victory in the war, too, often coming at the beginning of radio broadcasts or newsreels. And for extra fun, of course, Beethoven's Symphony, standing for victory over the Germans, used the music of a German composer. Um, but war bonds, as much money as they raised, still could not finance the entire war. And so the income tax, which previously had affected only a very small percentage of the U.S. population, um, was increased, both in the number of people it touched and how much it touched them for. In 1944 and 1945, the highest tax bracket paid 94% of all money they made above $200,000. The money they made below $200,000 was taxed at a lower rate, although still pretty high by today's standards. People today like to complain about tax rates that get up into 30-some percent, but in the 1940s and 50s, you might be paying over 90% of your income, at least if you were very, very rich. But most Americans, especially those making less than $200,000 a year, felt that these sacrifices were worth it. And even Americans who had opposed the war beforehand now came to support it. The Isolationist America First Committee dissolved itself on December 10, 1941. And its most famous spokesman and famous isolationist, Charles Lindbergh, volunteered to train pilots for the U.S. Army Air Corps but was turned down, the U.S. government fearing that he might be a Nazi sympathizer at heart. But he was eventually given a job as a civilian technical advisor, helping to, um, and helping to train pilots who would fight the Japanese, um, also flying in planes and developing ways to make planes and their crews more efficient, which did result in him actually flying um, in about 50 combat missions over the Pacific while technically a civilian, on one of which he actually shot down a Japanese warplane. And the government made absolutely sure people knew how important the war effort was through the Office of War Information, which produced a constant stream of propaganda through posters, magazine articles, newspaper stories, music, radio, and film. Even the entertainment industry was drafted into service. Um, movie and radio stars and directors were given jobs in the military or in the Bureau of Motion Pictures, which was part of the Office of War Information, to promote the war effort and to record it for posterity. Each branch of the military also had their own film crews, again, to record the war as it was going on uh, and to provide footage that could be used to promote the war effort um, through newsreels back home. 
The Office of War Information supported women in the workforce, creating, among other things, the character of Rosie the Riveter, um, in depicting a woman um, working a pretty hefty man's job. Um, cartoon characters, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Bugs Bunny, Popeye, and others, um, all went into uniform to fight the Axis and to promote the life of the soldier and the value of helping the war effort at home as they took part in scrap metal drives and there's an entire cartoon about Donald Duck paying his income taxes. Music um, was written and performed to glorify soldiers and the war effort and the cause they fought for. Entire radio series and movies promoted the war effort either outright or just by telling patriotic stories. Indeed, the movie Sergeant York was created in 1941, before the U.S. was officially in the war, but to promote um, support for the Allies nonetheless. While many Americans were isolationists, the Warner Brothers themselves felt America should intervene in Europe, and so created a, a movie showing a pacifist discovering that war was sometimes worth fighting. Um, when the movie finally came out in theaters, it was the attack on Pearl Harbor came shortly afterwards, and the movie really became a hit at that point. Some men walking straight from the movie theater to the recruiting office to join the Army. Alvin York himself volunteered to return to the Army because he found out the Army was rejecting many volunteers and draftees from rural areas because they were illiterate, and York offered to lead all the illiterate soldiers into battle against the Germans. Um, but the Army, sadly, turned him down. One of the longest lasting creations of the Office of War Information, which indeed is still around today, is the Voice of America, the official broadcasting service of the United States, which pr produces radio programs broadcast around the world. Um, new news, but entertainment too, a lot of music, sports, and other things, but broadcast where they'll be heard by countries um, we want to keep friendly or maybe make friendly to us. Um, as they certainly promote a very positive view of America around the world, also broadcast, in some cases, news and other information into countries where local censorship would keep people from hearing um, all the news there is. Of course, during World War II, they broadcast news um, into Axis-occupied territories to encourage the people the Axis had conquered um, and to demoralize the Axis by broadcasting Allied victories. But after the war, it would do the same thing, broadcasting during the Cold War into communist countries, and today, too, into countries that we would like to influence one way or another. The Office of War Information also had a psychological warfare branch that tried to demoralize America's enemies by broadcasting news and dropping leaflets from planes telling about America's economic productivity, our military successes, and other things. Um, they would drop sewing kits behind enemy lines at a time when lots of people sewed their own clothes. Sewing kits are awfully handy, but also fun if the pin cushion in the sewing kit is shaped like a dog fiddler. And you need a place to stick your pins. The government even began to organize spying more closely, creating the Office of Strategic Services. Um, of course, infiltrating foreign societies and industries helping supply and train foreign groups fighting against the Axis, carrying information to enemy lines. And after World War II, the OSS um, would later develop into the CIA, which still spies for us today. But while America wanted to spread liberty throughout the world, there was still intolerance in America. Of course, the Japanese on the West Coast were interned. Um, but other races faced problems, too. In the military, um, African Americans still served in separate units. Um, when given the chance, they often fought very bravely and effectively, most famously the Tuskegee Airmen, also known as the Red Tails, who were some of the most uh, capable pilots um, in Europe. But in many cases, black soldiers did not get the opportunity to uh, to serve because they were still mostly led by white officers who felt they were only good for manual labor. So a lot of them served as truck drivers or as cooks. Um, all of both of those are important. Um, at home, the Great Migration continued, or perhaps renewed, having kind of dropped off during the Depression, 
as, as black workers again moved to northern cities to get good jobs in the factories. All of this was not always welcome. Um, in 1943, for example, there was a race riot in Detroit in which 25 blacks and nine whites were killed, um, begun due to local workers resenting black labor coming in. To assist American farmers, the Bracero program was developed between the U.S. government and Mexico to bring Mexican workers into the U.S. to work on Western farms. After the war, some stayed, um, others returned under the terms of the program. Um, some Mexicans and also um, Latinos, uh, American citizens, moved into cities to find work and again were not always welcome. Um, and the most famous case of racial violence against Latinos um, actually began in part um, over the clothes that they wore. A popular style of suit among young men, especially young Hispanic and black men, was the zoot suit. Um, a very baggy suit with very broad shoulders, a very long coat tail, although a narrow waist, also very baggy pants. At a time when cloth was rationed, um, for most men, unless you were making your own suit or buying one on the black market, um, jackets had to be very short. Pants couldn't even have pleats because that wasted a couple inches of cloth. And so these zoot suits were unpatriotically baggy, and again associated with uh, with Hispanic and black young men primarily. In June of 1943, June 3rd, a group of American sailors on leave in Los Angeles ran into a group of young Mexican-American men in zoot suits and they got into a fight, as young men sometimes do. When word got back to the fleet that there had been a fight between some sailors and some Hispanics, other sailors went into town, um, seeking out Hispanics beginning these zoot suit riots. Some got in taxis and cruised the town, just looking for Mexicans to beat up. When they could, they stripped off their zoot suits, piled them up, and made burn bonfires of the suits. And similar zoot suit riots spread to other cities, too. Initially, of course, the media blamed the Mexicans. But other people, including Eleanor Roosevelt, said this really just showed the larger problems of racism and um, poor conditions that poverty and prejudice force many Mexican Americans to live in. On the other hand, many Latinos served in the U.S. military in large numbers. In fact, the percentage um, of Hispanics serving in the U.S. military was larger um, than their overall population in the U.S. And unlike black or Asian soldiers, they did not have to serve in segregated units, for the most part serving alongside other American citizens. Although in some places with heavily Latino populations, you did get units that were mostly Mexican-American, some Texan units, for example. And the 65th Infantry Regiment, recruited in Puerto Rico, um, was entirely, of course, with Puerto Rican members. Even American Indians served in World War II. Indeed, American Indians um, often serve in the military, many of them coming from cultures that traditionally value um, experience in warfare, Joining the U.S. military was one way um, to kind of fulfill um, the, um, that old cultural imperative. In fact, during World War II, she, uh, Joseph Medicine Crow from the Crow Nation became the last member of his tribe to earn the title of War Chief. Um, and, you know, Joseph Medicine Crow um, earned the title of War Chief of the Crow Nation by performing four feats of bravery required to be a war chief. Um, fighting the Nazis, um, he achieved the feat of touching an enemy without killing him, showing how brave you were, and taking an enemy's weapon. Um, in, in this case, by wrestling with a German, nearly choking him to death, um, he took pity when the soldier said mama, as what would have been his last words, and let him go, but, but kept his gun. Um, later on, he led a raid on his own, um, leading a successful war party, being one of the three feats of bravery. The fourth required feat of bravery is stealing an enemy's horse. And even during World War II, um, most forces used horses for some, in some things. Um, and he led a raid to steal some German horses, making him the last war chief of the Pro Nation. Um, as most of those things aren't things you get to do in regular life. So, while there were some problems, um, overall the home front 
Um, and its amazing productivity allowed America to truly be the arsenal of democracy Roosevelt had promised we could be to supply the Allies what they needed to win the war.